Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. Oh, it's good to be in church. Amen? Amen. Let's try that again. It's good to be in church. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Yes. Aloha. <laughs> All right. Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your word. I ask now that you would help me to minister your word with accuracy, integrity, and boldness. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us ears to hear and hearts to understand. Thank you, Lord, that we are not just hearers of the word, but we are doers of the word. In Jesus' name, we apply your word to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Say this with me. I've come to church tonight, come to, church tonight. to receive spiritual wisdom, receive spiritual wisdom. and spiritual understanding. spiritual understanding. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. help me see your ways clearly and in areas of my life where I've been ignorant, where I've been confused, where I've been misled, where I've even been deceived. Help me to see and to know your truth for my life in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm teaching a series entitled The Committed Life. This committed life is key to our success. It's key to living by faith. And what I brought out Sunday was the committed life, the connection and the tie to this committed life, what you're going to get out of this teaching, first and foremost, is a commitment to live according to what the Word of God says. And I believe that you make that commitment now. <laughs> and when I say now, meaning faith is now. Right? Because the only way to live a committed life is to live it by faith. You can't, you can't really live a committed life based on how you feel. Because if you, if you try to live a life committed to the Lord based on how you feel, at some point in time, you'll pull back from your commitment. But if you'll make a decision in your heart that you're going to live committed to the Word of God, I believe that commitment of faith will carry you through times when you don't feel like staying committed. And every one of us, at some point in time in our life, is not going to feel like staying committed. But when you live a committed life by faith, and you make that commitment before you ever face those challenges and see those circumstances, it'll carry you through. Amen? And so there's some things that I've pointed out, and we're going through step by step, that really just the Spirit of the Lord gave me a number of weeks ago. First was faith to believe, and we looked at that in the Scriptures. You have to have faith to believe. That's where it begins, right? Faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith to believe in salvation. Faith to believe that you can be born again. Faith to believe that your sins are forgiven, right? And so we looked at some of those things. And then we looked at faith to be a disciple. Because the next step after being a believer is being a disciple. That discipleship is a commitment that is a little bit greater than just believing in Jesus Christ and that your sins are forgiven. I mean, this is faith to commit to follow the Lord, right? Then we looked at faith to follow. So faith to be a disciple and faith to follow, because that goes right hand in hand. And then we looked at faith to stay. And we looked at faith to stay in a number of things, and I won't go back. If you haven't been here, you can get, those, uh, get these messages online uh, on YouTube or on uh, different uh, various uh, platforms that we have available. You can go to our website and find that out. But we're also looking at, and we looked at this last week, and I want to go a little bit deeper in this tonight, faith to count the costs. Faith to count the costs. A lot of people, and I touched on this last week or on Sunday, a lot of people don't want to necessarily face the circumstances of, of the costs that it, it, what it costs them to stay committed, right? I gave you an example. If you've ever went and purchased a, a car and you go to the salesperson 
they want to make sure first that you've sat in that car, you touched that car, you looked at that car, you smelt that new car. <laughs> then they want to take you in the little office and talk about the cost. But first they want you to get all excited about that new car. What I've noticed even in recent years that's a little different is now they want you to, they want you to try to make a commitment that you're going to leave there with that car. I've even seen them go as far as, we'll let you take that car home tonight. And right from the get-go, I've noticed they'll say, you want to leave here tonight with this car? What are they trying to do? They're trying to verbally get you to commit and emotionally get you com to commit before you ever see the interest rate, before you ever see the terms and conditions, <laughs> before you ever see the dealer's fees and the on and on and on that they, they want to tack on to it. They're trying to get you to commit from the get-go, right? And we have to, as Christians, we have to count the cost of what it means to be a disciple, we have to count the cost of what it means to stay committed as a Christian to live by faith according to the Word of God. And I believe this really separates people from just being, and, and I don't mean to be, this isn't meant to be judgmental, but just sort of a, help me Lord. <laughs> from just being called a Christian and actually living as Christ-like. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, the best way I know how to describe it, it's like you see people that go to sporting events and they wear jerseys. But they aren't actual players they're just fans. And they wear the jersey of their professional sports team, maybe their favorite player. But then there's, there's people that are down on the actual field or on the court. They actually have the ball in their hands. They've committed themselves to discipline, to exercise, to, to practice, 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 practice. And those are the men and women who are actually the athletes, right? They actually put the ball in the hoop or hit the ball over the fence or whatever the case may be, whatever sport it may be. They're the ones that have decided to be dedicated and committed to the sport. The other people wear the shirt, wear the jerseys. Not actually, they're not actually the athletes that are, that are committed to it like the others are committed to. And for me, I believe the calling on my life, specifically, I know what it is, is to teach. Because this is what the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me when I was in my early 20s, start a church and teach my people who they are in Christ Jesus, their covenant rights and privileges through the word of God so they can live a victorious Christian life. And so to me, as a pastor, my calling, I believe it's to teach you who you are in Christ Jesus. So you're not just someone who observes what goes on, but you are one who participates with your Christianity, who participates with your faith, who is willing to say in the face of, of circumstances, I will walk by faith and not by sight. For me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Okay? So I want to kind of set that so you understand kind of the position that I preach from. It's, it's maybe a little different than others, but it's just the calling that I believe that the Spirit of the Lord's put on my life. Okay? So here, let's go to... Uh, Let's look at something here because I think this is important and valuable because it's all tying together with the help of the Lord. Go to Matthew chapter 9, 35, please. Hmm. Hallelujah. <laughs> because God has called the church, you and I, to be the church that walks in and demonstrates and that is not, a, not afraid and not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And we've been called to the supernatural. 
Say the supernatural. supernatural. It always kind of makes me scratch my head when I talk to believers who sort of shy and skirt away from supernatural. Part of, I think, I mean, by virtue of being a Christian, being Christ-like, it only makes sense to me that we believe to get supernatural results in our life. We don't just live as a Christian and then stop right when it comes to our faith and, and expecting something that is beyond the natural way or the natural uh, path or the mat- natural circumstances. I mean, you know, where somebody's dealing with something physically, we believe for healing in the name of Jesus, right? When someone's dealing with uh, an area of depression or oppression, we believe in the supernatural power of God for that to be broken from their life in the name of Jesus Christ, right? You see, we cannot, I don't believe we cannot as Christians just settle for just all the way it is, the way it is. We've got to be willing to stand and believe God to get supernatural results, okay? Beyond natural, normal path and, and, and way things happen. So, and I believe we should be demonstrating that as a church. I believe we should be demonstrating the power of God. Amen? And this shouldn't just be an option. It should be the standard of what we believe and what we stand for. So Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages in the area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. Say good news. Good news. About, the about the kingdom. Something else you're going to see in this teaching about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the realm of God. The kingdom of God is the reality of God. The kingdom of God is the power of God. The kingdom of God is the government of God. It's the way God works. When we see the kingdom of God, we understand that the kingdom of God is the reality of God. And so Jesus now is preaching this different reality, this good news of the kingdom of God. And he's telling them and teaching them something that they weren't familiar with. That, they, that wasn't the normal of what was being taught and preached in the synagogues. And so he does this, and then it says, and he healed every kind of disease and illness. That was supernatural. Would you agree? And you notice that he almost, if you will, set it up. He set it up. He set it up by teaching and preaching in the synagogues about the good news of the kingdom. I guarantee you, what is he teaching? What's good news to the sick? That you don't have to be sick. What's good news to someone who has a disease? That you can be healed of the disease. And so he's teaching this, and then he's demonstrating it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the same gospel of the kingdom that should be taught and preached and demonstrated today in our churches. Amen. And in our own lives, we got to get a hold of this for our own lives and believe this in our own homes, with our own children and our own family. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's important it's preached. It's important that it's talked about. This is important that it's revealed in the Word, right? That you see it in the Scriptures in your own Bible. We put it up here, but I encourage you, get a Bible, bring a Bible, underline it, Highlight it, you know, get different colored highlighters, you know, that's kind of what I do. And now the Bible apps, you can do this, you can highlight with Bible apps. I just, I do certain things like if it's something to do with finances or increase, I highlight it with green because of money, okay, increase. If it's, if it's healing, I highlight it in red because it's the blood of Jesus, you know, and so there's different things that I highlight, you know, if if it's, it's power and authority, you know, I'll, I'll highlight it in purple, because I see royalty. So there's authority associated with it. So have, come up with a system for yourself. So when you're reading your Bible and you see these things, you go, wow, that stands out to you. And you recognize it. Because probably there'll be a time that you'll be ministering to someone who's going through something. And you'll need to be like, 
to be able to go to your own Bible or go to even a Bible app, that's fine, and go there and, and you'll see the highlights and go, this is what they need. They need this red right here right now because they need the blood of Jesus because they've been dealing with some sickness in their body or something like that, okay? So I'm just encouraging you, come up with your own system. But I, I think it's important it's preached. I believe it's, it's, it's important it's talked about. And I believe believe it's very important that you see these things revealed in the scriptures, in the word of God. Because the word of God is the foundation for what you believe. Amen? And when this happens, I'm telling you, this is how, when it's preached, when it's talked about, when it's, when it's revealed and demonstrated in the word of God, this is how faith is developed in our lives to expect the supernatural. Amen? And our faith should be developed to a point that, that as, as this happens, as it's preached, as it's talked about, as it's revealed in the Word, what happens is faith is developed in your heart and your life for the supernatural, and you get to the place in your own life where you're a doer of the Word. Amen? Amen. Say, I am, I am a doer of the Word. How many of you, you just want to be a doer of the Word? I mean, you just want, you just want it to be part of your life. Amen? You know, Minister Leslie, he, he, he just brought it right out, Luke chapter 6. Let, let's go there. He went there, let's look at it again. Luke chapter six, uh, 6, verse, let's go to 45, let's go to 44. <laughs> Luke six forty four. I'm going to read New King, uh, just King James, excuse me, King James translation. I know you guys don't have, I didn't give it to you, but you got it. So for every tree is known by his own fruit. Your life is known by its fruit. People know you by the fruit of your life. Jump down, verse 45. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Say abundance of your heart. So you, you need to ask yourself, what's in my heart in abundance? Because only you can answer that. Only you can control that. But you can control that. If all you put in, 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 your, in your own heart, you know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs that we're to guard our heart with all, what? Diligence. Diligence. For out of it flows the issues of life, Right? Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. You can control what's in your heart in abundance. You know, I think this, is, this really changed my life when I began to realize this. This is, in my, I was in my early 20s, and I began to just get a revelation of this. And I began to see how our spirits were designed and created by God to function. This was so, such a big deal to me. When you put the word of God in abundance in your heart, the result of it is faith. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so I determined in myself I was going to put the word of God into my ears and into my heart so I would, that would be what was in abundance in my heart. Because I saw that <clears throat> that is critical. Because out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth would speak. And what I said out of my mouth would set the course for my life. <clears throat> I like what I, I, I heard this example of this, this um, back many, many years ago in the Canary Islands, there was a, one of the worst, at the time, worst commercial aviation accidents that had ever happened. And there was two large commercial airliners that collided. There was, uh, it was... <clears throat> very dense fog on the field, and they had closed down part of the airport, and they were using one of the active, they were using a runway as a taxiway, because the taxiway was closed down, if I have it correct. And so what they would do is they would pull the aircraft out, they would taxi down the runway, turn around, and then they would take off. And what happened is one of the aircraft violated uh, the, 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 the command from the tower and there was a plane that had taxied down and was taking off 
and this other plane now strolls out onto that runway to taxi, and they collided. <clears throat> and there was a man on that aircraft that was sitting there when that collided, and then when this happened, the, the jets exploded, the, the, the jet fuel exploded, and this wall of jet flame fuel just poured down the fuselage like a, a wave of heat and fire. And this man sitting there saw it coming at him, and in that moment of tragedy, he spoke out of his mouth life and faith. In that instant moment of, of this is about to hit him, the man sitting next to him uh, was a Christian uh, man, businessman. They were both Christian businessmen, but this guy screamed uh, obscenities because he was fearful, okay? And he yelled out something of faith out of his mouth, and he looked at this man and this man's flesh melted off of him in front of his eyes. And he said he was like encapsulated, almost, if you will, in a bubble while everybody else perished around him. And he said, he, he then said uh, uh, the, the, the name of Jesus again out, it, while he was then there, and I believe it was a 747, and I believe the top of that fuselage is about 10 feet from where he was standing. And he said he wasn't a man that was in shape physically. But he said he saw a hole suddenly there in the top of that fuselage. And when he said the name of Jesus, he suddenly found himself out of that hole like this. And he lifted himself out, slid down onto the wing, ran out of the, off the wing, jumped off the wing, which is 20 feet, I believe, from the tip of that wing to the ground. And he cracked a bone in his ankle. But other than that, there wasn't anything else that happened to him. And when I heard that story many, many years ago, it brought such a revelation to me, this scripture verse, a good man of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And I believe that God designed our spirits that if we will put in abundance and if we will commit to the word in abundance in our heart, when we are faced with pressure. Now, it doesn't have to be something that tragic of pressure, but it could just be something that sort of takes you off guard. Somebody says something to you. You might get a, a doctor's report that is not good. It is key, I believe, what comes out of your mouth. And out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. We have been given life and death that has been set before us. Oh, that you would choose life. This is very important. Because as we commit to the things of God, when we commit to the living Word of God, and we put it in our heart, in abundance, I believe it makes all the difference in our life. And the outcome of our life. Go to Matthew chapter 4. Well, no, you're still there. Let's keep reading in, in Luke. He says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Look at this now. He says, why call me Lord, Lord. Now, this is someone who calls him Lord, right? And do not the things which I say. This isn't somebody who doesn't call him Lord. This is someone who calls him Lord. There are people who call Jesus their Lord, but they don't do what he says. Amen. Amen. He said, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them. He comes to him. I like there's a minister that I really look up to, if you will. Charles Caps, he said, these right here are the three steps to success for the Christian. He says, number one, the person who comes to him. He said, number two, the person who heareth his sayings. And he says, number three, the person that does them. 
Three keys to success. Come to the Lord, hear his sayings, and do what he says. Pretty simple. Easy for me to understand and comprehend and get a hold of. You know where the Bible says that life and death is? Where is it at? It's in the power of the tongue. Isn't that interesting? Life and death in the power of the tongue. Let's keep reading. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I'll show you who he's like. He's like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against the house, upon the house, and it could not shake it. Say, it could not not. shake it. One thing that was I like to point out here is it doesn't say it did not shake. It says it could not shake. Meaning it wasn't even possible for it to shake because it was already founded on the rock. It wasn't like, well, this time it didn't shake. No, it could not shake. See, there, that, that's my, like, well, you're splitting hairs. You're kind of getting a little caught up on the semantics of this. No, you need to know that when you put your life on the rock, you come to him, you hear his sayings, and you do it, you cannot be shaken. Say, I build my life on the rock. I come to the word. I hear the word. And I do what the word says. My life cannot, will not be shaken. But he that heareth and doth not. He that heareth and does not. So listen, this person, this this second thing here, the second person that he's talking about in verse 49 did step one. He obviously came to him because he heard the sayings, right? The only thing the second person missed in this equation is doing it. That's it. It says, he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation. What did we talk about last week? I said, there are things that you learn from doing. Remember I told you, I gave you the example of the person, you know, I said, how many of you would want to jump in an airplane with somebody who said, I went and took my pilot's license? Meaning, I went and got the book, studied the book, took the test, passed the test, and I got them all right. And he said, well, have you ever, have you ever flown an airplane? And he said, well, no, I've never even sat in an airplane, but I took the test. Did I, did I remind you I got all the answers right? He said, yeah, but have you ever flown an airplane? Well, no, but I took the test. See, there are things that you learn from doing. And that's key. You come to him, you hear what he says, and then you do it. You act on it. You apply it in your life. Say, apply it to my life. It is so important that you apply this to your life. Don't just come here, sit, listen, and leave and don't apply it. And then talk and get afraid and worried and talk doubt and unbelief and my family and this person and that person. I don't know why this is happening to me. Seems like one thing after another. No! You don't, you're, you're missing the very foundation that will hold you firm during those times. You, you, in the midst of it, you say, thank you, Lord, that you're my help. Thank you, Lord, that you're my refuge. Thank you, Lord, that no weapon formed against me will prosper. Every tongue that rises against me will be condemned and proven in the wrong. What are you doing? You're being a doer of the word. You're being a doer of the word. This is so important to be a doer of the word. Amen. All right, go to Matthew 14, 14. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm. Expect more than enough. (laughs) I'm going to keep reminding you of that this year. Expect more than enough. Amen. Hallelujah. 
you know, I believe that if, if you're here and you're believing God for a spouse, don't just believe for just somebody. Believe for more than enough. Amen? If you're believing for a financial breakthrough, just don't believe God to just get by a little bit. Believe for more than enough. Amen? I mean more than enough, more than enough, more than enough. Matthew 14, 14, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them. And what did he do? Healed the sick. Hallelujah. Supernatural power of God. Say it with me. Supernatural power of God. That's what we expect, right? I mean, we just have that expectation in our life. That's what people from this church do, by the way. This church, we expect the supernatural power of God to work in our life on a regular day basis, right? We don't just like every once in a while, like, oh, now I need it, right? You're not going you, to use it up, okay? You, you, you believe God for a miracle. I like what Andrew Womack says. He says, hey, when the power of God goes to work in your life, the lights in heaven don't dim. It's not like, you know, no, there they go again. Come on, we only have so much. What are you doing? Again, seriously, you just used it yesterday. No, every day we have an expectation for the supernatural power of God to work in our life. Amen. I mean, some of you need it to wake up. Some of you need it to sleep. Well, the supernatural power of God is here to do both. Hallelujah. Jesus saw the huge crowd. He healed the sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that is unnecessary. He said, that is unnecessary. Now listen, he didn't say that is necessary because I'm here. He said, that isn't necessary uh, because, oh, by the way, I brought a bunch of food and... It's in the, in the boat if you want to go get it. You probably missed it. It was under those burlap sacks. It's not what he said. He said, that isn't necessary, right? What did he say next? You feed them. <laughs> Can you imagine if you were standing there? And he said, that's not necessary. You feed them. Right? You know, as a, as a pastor, people in churches have needs, right? What if I said, hey, I know somebody who's going through something. You take care of their need. And in a sister so-and-so, they're going through something. Hey, you over there, you take care of their need. You know what a lot of people's attitude, I'm not saying it's your attitude here, but it could be. Just let the pastor take care of it all. Just let them, let them do all the ministering, all the helping, all this, all that. No, I think we should come to church with an expectation that if I see a need in somebody's life, I'm, gonna, I'm looking to be a blessing. Amen? I mean, some people need prayer that, that they won't even, they're like intimidated to talk to me or something like that. They might just slide in the back, sit in the back, and slide out. You see them, and the Spirit of the Lord prompts, it, prompts you to go minister to them, to go love on them, you, you meet their need. You go pray with them. You go love on them. You go shake their hand. You go hug their neck. You don't have to prophesy over them. Just go be Jesus to them. Amen? This is really interesting here. He says, you feed them. But look what they say. But we only have, or we have only, he says, but we have only five loaves of bread and two fishes, they answered. Bring them here, he says. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked to heaven, blessed them. Then break them, the, breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. Say more than enough. <clears throat> you feed them. P 
People that are committed to follow Jesus, I mean committed, there's a different expectation on our life. There's a different commitment on our life. It's called faith to be a disciple. Faith to be a disciple means that we're willing to do what needs to be done to get the job done. See, someone who's committed to this, we have, we have a, a, a revelation and a reality that God's word is our source and supply. Mm. God's word. See, this commitment to the word brings a revelation that God's word is our source and is our supply. This, is, it, <clears throat> this revelation has changed my life. Um, Jeff, how many times have you and I been here at this church, somebody's come in here with a need, and we get to start talking to them. And we, we, we just like that. I can tell we kind of like that because it's we now have an opportunity to direct them to the answer to the question they have. And you know what we're constantly saying to them in, 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 in such a cool way as the Lord directs us? The Word of God is your answer. 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 And I know they sit there and they blink their eyes and they look at us like we're not getting it. Like, no, I have a real need here, okay? And we're sitting there with two big smiles going, hey, we've had tons of needs in our life and the Word of God has been our answer and the Word of God has been our answer and the Word of God has been our answer and that is our source and that is our supply and He still is and the Word of God still is the source and the supply of all of our need. He's still supplying day in and day out. The Word of God is still our source and our supply. See, as you grow in your commitment, that becomes greater, a greater revelation to you. And what happens is now you begin, the Lord begins to stretch you. And he begins to put bigger things on your plate. And you'll get to a point in just a few years, you'll look back at where you were at and you'll almost laugh at the struggles that you had because you go, I remember when we were struggling to make the car payment and now our cars are paid for and now we're actually buying a car for somebody else. I'm telling you, this is what, this is the path that the revelation that he is your source and your supply, that he will meet all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm telling you, that's what this commitment to this word in your heart does. And I'm telling you, when you put it in abundance in your heart, man, I remember I was at a place of need, and I got a hold of this revelation, and I thought, you know what? I don't care what the cost is, I'm going to commit to the Word. And I, we, were, we had two businesses we were running at the time, and mostly just my wife and I running them. We had some employees, but we were doing that. I was, we had the ministry as well, which was a full, you know, full-time thing in itself, and we were just going, going, going. And I found myself slacking on the word for myself. And I thought, nope, this, is a, this isn't right. And I committed to stay up no matter how late it took me, I was to stay up until I felt like I was satisfied. And sometimes it was one in the morning and often it was three in the morning. I committed to the word because I saw in the word that the word was my source and my supply. Not the businesses, not my work, not anything else. I, I, don't, I didn't care what it cost me I had this mentality that I'm not going to die from a lack of sleep, but I might die from a lack of word. <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of for me. I'm not telling you you have to do this, but I'm just telling you that's where I was at. And we saw more increase in that year. I did that for about a year straight. I saw more increase in my life than I had seen in probably all my years combined. And I'm telling you, there is something about that, that commitment to the word the word works. And in what happens when you do that, the word of God gets an abundance in your heart. Yep. When the word of God gets an abundance in your heart, your mouth talks and you begin to find yourself talking nothing but faith and life and hope 
and victory. And I'm telling you, it just comes out one day after another day after another day. And you see a circumstance, but the word of God is so big in your heart, all you do is speak faith out of it. And then everybody around you thinks you're cuckoo because they don't, you, you don't, you know, they're like, what is this guy? All he is is t speaking the word and faith, you know, come on, where's reality? And you, your whole perception has changed because now you're speaking from faith. Anybody ever experienced anything similar to this at all? You know, I'm telling you, it is, it's the best way to live. And if you've experienced it, and some of you, and I, I've done it, gotten away from it, and then I get back to it. So don't get down on yourself if you know it, you got away from it, just get right back to it. And I'm not sitting here advocating you have to stay up till three in the morning. I'm just telling you what I did, okay? What I'm saying, what I am saying is put a priority on it. Put a priority on it. Clearly says in Matthew chapter 6, go, go to Matthew chapter 6. Thank you, Lord. Let's, let's look at verse 19. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up, now think about that, lay up for yourselves. Say that with me. Lay up for yourselves. There's, so there's something that you can do to lay up for yourself. Think about that. I can do something that's going to lay up for myself Treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. I pray that you get a revelation on that. I think of this verse right here, I mean, on such a regular basis. You ever work hard for something, spend good money on something, only to see it like start to rust or moth or, or, you know, it just seems like, what in the world? I spent good money on that and it's like already falling apart. Every time I see something falling apart, I think of this verse. Well, it's where the Bible says it's where moth and rust does corrupt and break thieves break through and steal. I mean, my treasure's not in that. Hmm. For where your treasure is, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either will hate the one and love the other, or else will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they neither sow, they, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Go ahead and answer it. Yes. Yeah, your life is more than a bird, worth more than a bird. Even if you're a bird lover, your life is still more than a bird. Which of you, by taking thought, it's the second time he's talking about your thoughts, okay? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why you take ye thought, third time he talks about our thought life, for Raymond, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, Oh, there's the fourth time. See the thoughts? See the thoughts? You know, you don't always talk it the first time it comes. But the thought keeps coming. I don't know if we're going to be able to make it. Thought comes again. I don't know if we're going to have enough. 
Thought comes again. I think we're going to be short. If you don't do something about those thoughts, you're going to find yourself talking about what you're thinking about. Therefore, take no thought saying. Right? What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Look at this. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of the, all these things. Here it is, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. And all these things shall be added unto you. One more time, just, just in case you didn't get it the first four times. Take, therefore, no thought for tomorrow. Five times we are instructed of what to do with our thoughts. You see, Jesus said to those disciples, those Jews which believed on him, remember, if you continue in my word, you'll be my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Those who continue in the word. Remember, remain in the word, abide in the word, all those things are key to what you're doing. You, we, we, in James chapter 1, verse 22, we looked at this. He says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Say it again, doer of the word. He says in verse 24, you see yourself, you walk away, and forget what you look like. Now listen, I think this is an example of people go to church, they hear it, and they walk out, and they forget what they heard because they don't do it. We are doers of the word. Listen, I, even for my own self, and, and uh, there's stuff going on. You know, there's always stuff going on, right? When we live in this world, there's darkness in this world, right? But I have to remind myself, you're not just a hearer of the word. You're a doer of the word, Aaron. I, I literally talk to myself like that. Because there's stuff that goes on, I go, no, you're not just a hearer, you're a doer. And I'll just say it out loud and remind yourself, go ahead, I mean, you can do that. It's okay to do that, I think. I mean, people talk to themselves, you know, oh, you're such an idiot, you're so stupid. They say that about themselves. Don't say that about yourself ever again. Don't talk like that to yourself. Say, I'm a doer of the word. Amen. Now, let, let, me, let me keep going here, because I want to get to something here, and I, I, Lord just took us in different directions, and I like it, all right? Go with me to uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Say this, by faith... I count the cost. Hmm. There is a cost to staying committed to the word. And we have to count the cost of our commitment. But we do it by faith. See, I probably when I t said that about staying up till 1, 2 in the morning, you know, that I had to get up in the morning and, and go to work and run the businesses and things like that, some of you, you may have thought, Geez, that's just a little too much. I don't think I have to do that. Well, and I'm not saying you have to do that, but you do have to count the cost. You have to stay committed. You have to know what the vehicle costs, and you need to know what the fees are, and you need to know what the interest rate is. You don't want to be paying as much in interest as it is for the whole price of the car. Count the cost. Know what you're getting into. I mean, if, if you don't ask, they might not even tell you what the interest rate is. A large crowd was, uh, Luke 14, 25, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciples, you must, oh, disciples. That's committed ones, remember? Say committed ones. Right, remember he said uh, to the Jews that believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you'll be my disciples indeed, right? 
So this, this discipleship is someone who, who's committed, someone who's a learner, and who, someone who's a follower of Jesus. So if you want to be my disciples, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. <laughs> this is a pretty strong talk. Like, hate? What? I thought we should love everyone. Yeah, stay with it. By comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Woo! And if you do not carry on your own, if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Committed one. But don't begin until you count the cost. You see that? But don't begin until you count the cost. Say count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there would be enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. See, I, I read this, and as I was studying this, I thought, there are people, worldly people, who are laughing at Christians. Because the Christians have never counted the cost. And they haven't, t- they haven't counted the cost by faith and saying, I'm going to stick with what the Word of God says. They saw them talk a little bit of faith over here, and then they, they said it in front of their friends, and then behind closed doors, all they were doing is talking out doubt and unbelief and overwhelmed. Oh, I can't believe it. They're crying, and they're doing this, that, and the other. And, and their friends saw them speaking faith and trying to be all excited about it, but they didn't count the cost. Say, count the cost. I know this is good. It's like, I like this. This is good. Because God wants to see it completed in your life. He wants to see every work completed in your life. How you see things completed is you come to him, you hear his sayings, and you're a doer. You're a doer. He says, otherwise you might complete only the foundation, you run out of money, and everyone would laugh at you. They would say, There's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. He said, or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss the terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Hallelujah. I know this isn't the most exciting thing. I'll give up everything I own. Listen, you remember the, the rich young ruler that came to him and said, Master, what might I do to inherit eternal life? And he told him, and he, said, he told him about the, the, you know, the, the commandments. He said, oh, all these I've done for my youth. He says, there's one thing you lack. Sell all that you have, give to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. Right? And that, boy went, that young man went away sad, depressed, right? And then he goes on, and then the disciples begin to ask questions like, well, then who can serve you, you know? I mean, you, what, what's going on here, basically, is what he's saying. And then Jesus goes on and begins to, to continue to share, share with them, hey, there is no man who has left house, brethren, sisters, this, that, and the other, all these things, but shall receive a hundredfold in this life, and in the life to come, eternal life. See, when you give something up, you don't lose it when you do it for the Lord, when you do it for the kingdom of God. Whatever you give up for for the Lord, there is a hundredfold reward now in this time. Now in this time. And in the world and life to come, eternal life. And let me go ahead and add to that, if you, if you remember what we read, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Because now all of a sudden, all your value system shifts. And when that happens in your heart, because it happens in your heart, when your value system shifts to the kingdom of God, 
Now, all of what happens is you begin to put up treasures in heaven. And now when that shifts, you now become dependent upon the kingdom of God because your source and your supply is now him, not the world system. And that's why you can live a life not shaken. When the financial streams of life come and beat against you vehemently, <laughs> you cannot be shaken. Because you're founded upon the rock. You say, I know who my source is. I know who my supply is. I know who my God is. And you know what? We sang about it tonight. I am a child of God. And when you have the revelation that you are a child of God, you're committed to following him, and you know that all of your needs are not met according to this world system, but according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus it sets you free. You'll be the most free businessman, the most free businesswoman. You'll be the most free salesman or saleswoman because you are not dependent on the next sale, on the next paycheck, on the next this. You are dependent on the kingdom of God to meet all your need according to his riches and glory. You're not, you're not d dependent on what the medical world says you can or will do or can't do or everything else. I'm telling you, you have faith for the supernatural power of God to work in your life. And that is the most liberating free. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make and set you free. <laughs> Hallelujah. Did you get something out of that? Stand to your feet. Glory to God. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. We believe what the Word of God says regardless of how we feel, regardless of how many people there are to feed, regardless of how few fish and loaves we have. Amen? We, we believe the Word of God regardless of how big the waves are and how much water breaks into the boat. We, we, we believe the Word of God regardless of what the symptoms are, regardless of what the circumstances are. We just believe. Continue to believe the living word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We just glorify you and honor you and praise you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for being our source. Thank you for being our supply. It liberates us from having to depend on the world system and this and that and the other. Our eyes are upon you. And our whole body is filled with light. Oh, it's the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That glorious light. So freeing. So redeeming. We just give you praise. Just give him praise. Just thank him for, for being your God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we just rejoice. We rejoice. We rejoice. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I'm prompted by the Spirit of the Lord here as we've, been, as we've been studying and I've been preaching and teaching about the supernatural power of God and not just being a hearer but being a doer of it. If you have a need, physical need, financial need, family need, whatever it is, I just ask you to just, before we even dismiss, I want you to just come out of your seat, come forward up here. Just line up here, and we're, we're just going to we're just going to pray for you. We're just going to start. We're just going to do this right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. You just push them back a little bit. Yep, just a little bit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just get in a straight line across there if you can. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You stay here. 
You three stay here. Okay, yep. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'd like you to help us pray. The Lord yep. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What came in my up in my spirit? Oh, many things. There was financial. There was financial um, needs, but it wasn't just like an immediate need. It was almost like you have felt like you've never been able to like break out and see abundance on a consistent basis. You've had little things here and there, but you really haven't seen it flow in your life like like you'd like and what you're believing for. That was that was one area that I saw just in my spirit I'm saying. The other, one of the other things I saw was like fatigue. Almost like chronic fatigue. I don't even know if, I guess that's a thing. I don't know. But it's not going to be a thing in your life anymore. From this day forward. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Father. Now, I'm just going to pray in the Spirit here just for a minute. I'm just going to follow the lead of the Lord because I know there's certain things that He wants to have happen here. If you pray in the Spirit, I encourage you to do so at this time. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. having me do something I've never done before. If you're God's up here so happy. and you have a, if there's a financial need, if it's, if it's financial related, I'd like you just to put your hand up and hold it up if you're up here for a financial reason, okay? Jake and Jeff, you didn't know I was going to do this, but I want you two to pray for the people that have a financial need. Keep your hand up.
I'd like you to go lay your hands on them and pray with them. Ralph and Joanne, would you join them where that's concerned? Ralph's going to join you guys. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. Remember, he knows the need that you have before you even ask. You don't have to rehearse it. Just faith to believe for the miracle. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Nick, would you help me up here, please? If your hand is up and it's financial, I'd like you to come over here to this side. Just, just walk from here and come over here. If all others, come over on this side, please. Okay, so financial here, all others over here. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. In the same language. Here. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, make room over here. Uh, Nick, help usher these people and kind of get them lined up there. Yep. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Find out. Find out. He's financial here. If not, over here then. Okay? Thank you, Lord. All right? Now, what we're supposed to do is pray over people that physical. If there's anything physically that you'd like prayer over, um, I'd like you to raise your hand if you're over here. Raise your hand if there's some physical thing that you'd like prayer over. Okay? So we have one, two, three, four. All right? Five. All right. Praise God. All right. What came up in my spirit where that's concerned is that in the book of Philemon, it says that your faith becomes effective. It becomes active and effective by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you. Hmm. Healing was already provided. It's already provided for you by the blood of Jesus. And so as we come around and we pray and we lay hands, it's an acknowledging of, what, of that work that's already been done. And your faith is active to receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go. All right. So if you're over here, keep your hand up so we can know who you are. Step down here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God.